um, in Stuttgart. I come here to um, uh, the old form of converting, of, of sending emails. I mean, you remember the printers with the paper and the rolls on the side. And um, there's a communication here um, that I transcribed so they can actually read it um, between Phil Allen from Stony Brook and Manuel. So Phil was visiting Stuttgart. Thank you for your hospitality in Stuttgart. I enjoyed the visit very much. Today we have a visitor, Ken Wong from Kansas, who proposes an exiton mechanism for superconductivity. Super you remember that the question of what the mechanism is really concerned people for a decade. Not that they have answered it, but at the time they thought they would be able to answer it. Um, he, that is Ken Wong, cites Stuttgart spectroscopy, which identifies several Wittberg series with a 0.5 electron volt Wittberg constant. Is this your work? This is Monero's work. Why didn't you mention it? Um, could I have a preprint? Thanks and best wishes, Phil. So that's the kind of email communication Phil Allen had been visiting in Stuttgart and wanted to know why didn't Manuel tell him about this great program exodons. And the answer of Manuel is again the same style of emails at the time, and I described it. Um, I've seen the Kansas data, and I think they are plain nonsense. <laughs> They interpret all sorts of phonons as exotons. I did not know that they were blaming us for it. <laughs> you must have a preprint from them, not from me. Uh, thanks for your visit, and come again, Manga. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, this is also very characteristic of Manga. He was very open about his opinion um, on someone's theory, someone's experiment. And, he also not only made friends with that, because he would stand up and say, look, what you said right now is completely wrong. And he will explain to you in, in five minutes or so why it is completely wrong. And more or less, you didn't have a chance, because um, the occasions that I was there when such things happened, he was right in the end. And um, so he did not only have friends because of that, but this is the kind of open and honest communication that we all appreciate, because we know when Manuel would say something that's good, like in, in your case, Pablo, and then you were sure that it was good. So this is a, um, a letter, I should say, to me. Um, up here, you can recognize that it's addressed to me. And um, I don't remember exactly when it was. It was something like 86 or 87. And he must have been on a trip and left me a message for something to do while he was gone. Um, I transcribed it here also. Uh, maybe you can call Morris. Yes, in research, this is a neutron scatterer, and the question was about the lattice constants of the high temperature superconductors and particular positions, the oxygen atoms, which you could not determine by x ray or um, reasons that you know. So the questions are when would they need the, this is presidium samples, presidium superconductor, presidium barium copper oxide, which is not a superconductor, but it's the same compound. Um, what lattice, what results do they have? Lattice constant, oxygen content, or oxygen order. And um, uh, then there's a, a line here, and on the bottom it says, on the left part of my couch, next to the bookshelf, those who were in Shukka will know what exactly you meant. Um, they're all the structural data. Please select all the PR data and have a look at them. Lattice constants, question mark, that's a thing down here. So uh, basically he was leaving somewhere, he left me this note, and um, told me this is what you're going to do in the next few days until I get back, and then you have the answers to all of these questions. Typical work style, um, working hard, um, making sure that um, the results will continue. Um, <clears throat> there is a second person that they asked about lattice constant. This is Pinchulbius, who you know he worked in Sakhi um, on the phone scattering. And um, <clears throat> I only found the answer here um, by Pinchulbius. He had been asked by Manuel to tell him also the lattice constants of hydrogen uh, superconductors. And for some reason that I don't know, he didn't answer for a while. Um, so, his answer here is, dear Professor Cardona, please apologize for my long delay and for the long delay in my answer. Now I don't know what long delay was, half a year maybe or a couple of months. Um, only last week in Saclay, I was able to get printouts of our last model. Enclosed, please find the cube for zero phonons, determined by neutron scattering and the corresponding eigenvectors. The eigenvectors was something that was very important to Manuel um, in this high TC field. And for one, intellectual curiosity, but for two, if you had anything if phonons had anything to do with um, if phonons had anything to do with superconductivity, you would have to know the eigenvectors, the coupling constants, and so on. So Pinchovia sent in um, some phonon frequencies and eigenvectors, which in German are called polarization vectors. These are um, the vectors. Manuel made some um, U graph. He wrote down the numbers um, of the 
and show me those. Um, and you would write next to it, oh, that's okay. Uh, please have coffee to these guys. Um, this one is not okay. The other ones are kind of okay. And um, the letter by Pinchokis, the sending of the letter was on the 2nd of November, 1988. And on the 10th of November, he writes back to Pinchokis. Dear Mr. Pinchokis, thank you very much for your beautiful items. They all agree very well with ours, with the exception of the B2, B3, G140 wave numbers, which has an item vector. This IO mode has a 400 wave number. This is the comparison that um, I showed you before. I don't know into detail. Um, we find that B2G in three modes at 140 40 wave numbers, but with other item vectors. However, seven out of eight agreement is not bad. <laughs> so it's kind of also typical. Um, I think Cardona's statement that you will appreciate something, but you will say there's something wrong. This one part is wrong. Other thing that. So out of that came a paper, and that's cited frequently on um, phonon eigenvectors of lithium bearing carbon oxide. It was published in 1988, and so it was all in the same year. It was very rapid work, very intense um, collaborations. And uh, the experimental point of this paper is that uh, Manuel used the polarization selection rules to identify the various um, theory um, geometries, and uh, in particular the circular um, right, right, and left, left gave a chance to identify this phonon here, this is the so-called B1G phonon, which has been a big controversy at the time, and this was the paper that first and seriously and correctly um, identified the eigenvectors. This is a picture of all of the eigenvectors, Raman active modes, infrared active modes, and all of the eigenvectors from this calculation. And um, I think this is probably the, the authority of paper still today on the eigenvectors of uh, this compound. Um, one um, short acknowledgement um, at the end of this paper for all those who are in Stuttgart know, also the technicians, uh, Martin Zinos, Peter Wolster, who died at the time, and, um, and Helmut Hill. Um, you always acknowledge the, the technicians because you realize that um, the work is very um, they're necessary for doing good experiment, experimental work. You have to be kind and also acknowledge the contributions of the technicians. Um, many of you know. So here's another paper um, that shows you how he's able to criticize someone um, when they don't agree. This is a paper published by Gernot Günterholt. Um, where is he? Here, Gernot Günterholt from Cologne. At the time, Günterholt was um, also a postdoc or a visitor at Max Planck. Um, they published um, this series of books, Gernot and Günterholt, that are well known to all of you. Um, he published a paper um, on the eigenvector lattice mode and um, was different from, from our results. And um, instead of writing, um, well, they have different results, maybe they're also right, you would write Bus. Bus in German means really bad. Um, please return that sort of thing. Yeah. Here, and this is the answer that he wrote to Günther, what he first put it on the pencil and the manuscript itself. You mean the 641 vibrations of oxygen 1 or oxygen 4? Oxygen 1 is common forbidden, oxygen 4 has been identified rather conclusively, that is from the polarization selection rules that I showed you before, um, as the 500 wave number P. And um, needless to say that um, Cardona was right and Günther was wrong. The mode at 640, which was quite prominent in this paper, turned out to be a, an impurity compound, nothing to do with the IDC superconductor. Um, also remember that um, there was an email um, by Günther wrote to Cardona about this topic, and um, Cardona wrote also in the email something that he wouldn't really send to the, um, to the return to the sender. It was quite unfriendly. I don't remember exactly what it was. And by mistake, he hit reply instead of forward. You know, this happens once or twice in a life to everybody. And um, he came to me with kind of a red head and said, oh, I hit reply, and I wrote <laughs> stuff to, to Gernot Günther. But um, Gernot, many of you know him also, say, oh, yeah, no problem, it's okay. We're used to the form of interaction. Better to be honest than to be um, secretive about things. So <clears throat> here come a couple of um, other very significant results in the work of superconductivity, that is. The question if phonons are involved in any way, um, maybe supported or, or not, or maybe completely in the mechanism, then um, you should be able to show a connection to the magnetic field. That is, if you 
and put the superconductor in a high magnetic field to destroy superconductivity, then the phonons should also react. That is, if there's any connection, then um, magnetic field and phonons should um, go together. And uh, there's only one figure that I'm showing you here for um, zero magnetic field that would be a, around 50 Kelvin uh, transition, and the same phonon, there's a phonon at uh, 340 wave numbers, the B1G phonon that I showed you before, would shift in its transition temperature by a few degrees, by four or five degrees. So this is a quite significant paper, although uh, looking at it today, there's only really one data point that supports the line down here. So, um, but anyway, it was uh, published also in 88 and uh, proved that um, the phonon vibration, in particular this phonon eigenvector, is coupling, coupled to the superconducting system. It at the same time does not say that it's responsible for superconductivity. Um, this point is also made in another paper. Um, the second paper that I find quite um, interesting is how do the phonon line widths and frequencies react to uh, superconductivity. This is again the phonon at 350 wave numbers that we've been talking about. And um, there are two different compounds. Um, one is I think vitrium and the other one is erbium, barium copper oxide. Um, and you can see here at 90 degrees Kelvin, this is the frequency and the line width. And if you go down to 10 degrees Kelvin, the line width broadens quite a bit, and the frequency shifts also quite a bit. Um, in this other compound, it's the same effect as air line with changes and frequency changes, but it's much smaller um, than it is for the high temperature compound. And um, when I put together um, for a series of compounds, that is europium, dysposium, vitrium, with two different isotopes, isotopes will come later, a very important field for Manuel, and um, erbium and tulium, the line width change and the frequency change, the line width change together. And then from simple PCS theory, you can put a curve like this um, through the data point, you can identify a superconducting gap at um, two delta. And so that was um, one of the, I think, quite important um, experimental confirmations that there is a coupling between the lattice system and superconductivity. If you deduce the coupling constant from the frequency changes, and absolutely you get relatively small coupling constant, constants, something like 0 0.01, 0 0.02, um, which shows that they, when you introduce them into a PCS formula, are far from describing the superconductivity by itself. So you do have a coupling of the system. Phonons play some role, um, but in total, they're not fully responsible or not even 80% responsible for superconductivity. It's a famous paper by. Um, also by Simon Spignago that um, is a theory to, um, to this curve. I know damping is another um, piece of work that is, I think, very interesting. That is the um, question of when you, um, in this plot here, the phonon frequency versus wave vector, you can change the wave vector by changing the wavelength of the incident um, laser light when you do the Raman spectroscopy. Um, given the Fermi velocity, in this case, six times 10 to the seven centimeters per second. And when you change the wave vector in such a way that you move from outside of the Fermi surface to inside of the Fermi surface, um, then the line width changes. And you can see down here, for the high frequency phonons, there's no change observed. These are the phonons up here. Um, within the Q vector range that is available with visible laser light, um, you cannot get into the region of line of But for the low frequency phonons, you can see very well here, very sharp phonon at 150 wave numbers, and quite broad phonon at low frequencies, same thing for this phonon. So there is an um, experimental proof that the um, coupling, another experimental proof that coupling to the electronic system um, is present and measurable. I want to continue this work on other high TC compounds. This is the highest TC compound um, known until today. And um, experimental data are similar, perhaps even more exaggerated than in the vitrium barium copper oxide compound. You see at room temperature, some frequency, and at low temperatures, you see a very broad peak. And uh, analysis of the phonon frequencies, line widths, and uh, Q vectors. This is not the Q vector of the light, it's the Q of the phonon um, profile that you know. Intensities and so on, they all change at the transition temperature of around 120 degrees Kelvin in this um, compound. So here, this is um, the conclusion that I mentioned before. Um, 
The question of a possible connection between the observed strong electron phonon coupling and the remarkably high TC on the Mercury based superconducting group rates must remain open. So um, there was never any claim that phonons are responsible fully for superconductivity, but it was shown in many experiments, many compounds, that the coupling to the phonons is this. Now, coming to a completely different topic, um, little to do with superconductivity is bibliometry. Um, as you all know, and you mentioned already, Javier, that he was very interested in when it came up in, I don't know, when it came up exactly in the 90s or so, um, to look at a number of papers in H Factor, maybe a little later it came up. And uh, he did an analysis together with the librarian, with M. Alex, um, some of you know, um, and on papers of Ginsburg, not of his own papers, nothing to do with his papers. This contribution is the analysis of Ginsburg's papers related to superconductivity. And um, there's the publication yeah. and the year of the Ginsburg papers. And these are papers per year mentioned, that mentioned Ginsburg, and that you show that after the publication they mentioned, but then there'd be a characteristic increase around the time of the introduction of high conductivity because people would go back and look what did other people say smart things about. Analyze the Ginsburg article um, on theory of superconductivity and also on theory of superfluidity. There was another hype um, in superfluidity which you could show in 1996. I don't actually remember exactly what it was due to. Um, it must have been some novel um, discovery about um, superfluidity. So that's a few stories um, from the small time of eight years that I had the pleasure to work with Manuel Cardona and I tried to give you some insight in the way he works and some of the experimental results. Thank you very much for your attention.